What's up guys, today we're reviewing Matthew Syad, Rebel Ideas, book review on this channel. Let's go. The problem in safety isn't deviation, it's complexity. Health and safety has gone mad. Health and safety is trying to unpick having gone mad in the past. There's no one solution and one problem. The problem is that we are looking for one solution. Does the structure of the team allow them to flourish? Feel safe enough to be uncomfortable. The environment defines our behaviours. People aren't the problem, they're the solution. Rebranding safety, crushing the stereotype. Brought to you by Risk Fluent. What's up guys, welcome back to Rebranding Safety. Doing exactly what we say on the tin. What is that we're here to rebrand health and safety we're here to challenge those over the top crazy health and safety practices and change the perception of health and safety we do that on youtube by providing tips and tricks and book reviews like today so today matthew syad's rebel ideas i'm gonna be brutally honest this is a biased very biased book review i thought this book was awesome However, there is a comment from a kind of person who's really good at reviewing books, who does it for the Ice Magazine, which I'll touch on later. I'm gonna tell you three things that I really enjoyed. Storytelling. Matthew does so well to utilize the power of storytelling to communicate his one message, which essentially is around cognitive diversity. But how he does it is just so good. The book is varied with interviews and quotes from research, etc. And some of my favorite examples were the fish tank. If you listen to the podcast, then you'll know this over and over again. I say it all the time because for me, it was such a simple example, but a great story around some researchers that got some Japanese Japanese um, people to look at a fish tank and then describe the fish tank and some American people to look at the fish tank and describe the fish tank. The American people described when off the fish more than anything else. The Japanese people described the background, the context more than anything else. Therefore, we're already showing that cultural differences, hence diversity, can affect the way we even see things. I thought it was a very good example and Matthew just kind of illustrates it very well in how he writes it. So he takes those bits out of the research and just kind of drops them into his book very, very nicely. Air Force cockpit example, I think it was the American Air Force, if I remember rightly, um, where they kind of based this, the measurements of their cockpits on in um, averages. And then based on the research, um, after a load of crashes and, and stuff, and they couldn't really work out what was causing these crashes. They did some research into people fitting, how they fit into the cockpit, and they found that it was based on averages, and then they found out that nobody fit in that average. There was not one pilot in the Air Force that actually fit that average measurement. So it didn't work, and that was causing the crashes. So that kind of illustrated for me the danger of working off averages, the danger of assuming that one procedure is going to fit everyone at work, and that we have to understand diversity in our workplace. The different people fit different cockpits. There was another a really simple example um, that Matthew used to explain cognitive dissonance. So cognitive dissonance, from when I kind of probably misunderstood it, um, was basically when you make a decision and then the information tells you that that decision was wrong. You know the decision was wrong, yet you stick at it because it was your decision. I think we see this a lot. And the example he gave was he joined a gym and his wife said that gym is way too far away but he was like no no the gym's there I won't mind the commute because the gym's really good blah 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 as time went on he realized his wife was totally right he did, the commute was way too long to the gym and but he kept going hence cognitive dissonance so simple examples that he uses from his personal life combined with stories and research all together to tell that one golden thread of cognitive diversity it was for me fascinating some other things I enjoyed, the overall attention to detail, whether it was kind of explaining what the morning dew on the grass was like when he was traveling to the interview, for example, or just kind of beautifully narrating the town where they were. It was just so well done and it made me feel really invested into the book. And at times I felt like I was reading like a fiction book as opposed to a non-fiction book. I, I didn't feel kind of intimidated by the intelligence that was coming from the writer or anything like that. I felt comfortable reading it essentially was is kind of the best way I could describe it because it felt like a story and not like I was being shouted at. Do you know what I mean? Like boo, 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 information, which is what some kind of real academic books do to you, in my opinion, especially when you're trying to go to sleep and read this stuff. It's like, ugh. 
I did say I was going to add a kind of book review comment from a professional book reviewer, and that was Professor Tim Marsh. So we had him on the podcast. Go and check it out. It's a great conversation. We spoke about this book briefly in there. We spoke about a lot of Matthew's books, and I'll, I'll kind of I'll link them all in the description below. Um, but we spoke about this one, and Tim's comment, which to be fair, I think is a valid point, is that the whole book is essentially describing the two charts that we see on page 46 and 54. Um, those two charts do explain this theory extremely well, but I personally quite liked the stories. For me, it was like, look at the chart, and then the, the stories and the examples and the research gave me some real life relatable examples to kind of back up that, that those tables. So personally, I like that, but Tim made a fair comment that the book is a bit padded out and that essentially the whole book is explaining the things that they'd already explained on 46 and 54. It's a fair comment, it's a fair comment. So I walked away from reading this book like my eyes were open to the, to the world. Um, that, that is probably the best way I would describe this honestly to you. Sorry, my dog was just running in the garden, distracting me. I genuinely felt like I could see things a lot better. I genuinely felt like diversity now was so much more than just a tick box, that actually diversity is an asset. It's something that can really help us. And I thought, why doesn't safety do that? And then I thought like, well, it's not like we were never told not to do it or we never thought of it. Even risk assessments, you know, we, we were told to involve other people, team leaders, manufacturer, the kind of machine operator, for example, the supervisor, whatever you want to call them, and the safety people. And that there creates diversity, doesn't it? Dogs barking, distracting me, sorry. That there is cognitive diversity. Whether it's from a culture or whether it's from experience, it doesn't matter, it's still cognitive diversity. So it's just something that we, actually we knew for a long time, but we never really utilized. So for me, it was something we could take away and actually start to utilize. So tomorrow, why don't you go to your workplace and have a look around your boardrooms, your meeting rooms, and just see how many people of the same kind of diverse background, how many people are exactly the same. And then the way I like to think of it is the same people produce the same ideas. Therefore, if you've got all the same people in the same room, you're only ever gonna get the same ideas. So for example, maybe you're employing a safety professional tomorrow and you're working in manufacturing and your job advert says must have 10 years experience in manufacturing. The easiest way to describe cognitive diversity for me is that you've just failed and you're only ever gonna get experiences that are from manufacturing. Why don't you go and employ someone from healthcare or employ someone from construction? Because they've got ideas that come from construction that they can bring over that you would never see because you're only ever employing people from manufacturing. That's kind of a, an example that I see where we're failing in the safety industry every single day is by kind of shoehorning people and saying, oh, you must be from manufacturing. And if you're gonna work in construction, you must be from construction. It doesn't work. And that's what this book taught me. Hope you uh, enjoyed this video. Go and buy the book. Uh, links in the description below. Shout out, um, they are kind of, what's it called? Full disclosure, there we go. It is an affiliate link, so links help me. You know, you can go and buy this book and help your favorite podcast and, and YouTube channel when it comes to safety at the same time. So please buy it. See you later.